I want to give a warm welcome to uh, Professor Arthur Wilmarth Jr., who is Professor Emeritus of Law at GWU. Uh, he is the author of a great book, which I read over the weekend, called uh, Taming the Megabanks, Why We Need, need a New Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, and he's also uh, the, well, the reason that I actually reached out to him in the first place is because he wrote a letter to the Presidential Working Group um, about uh, regulating stable coins, and then also published a paper uh, then on called It's Time to Regulate Stable Coins as Deposits and Require Their Issuers to be FDI Assured in Banks. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Wilmars, thank you for, for coming on today. Um, so, I, I wanted to start with... It's a with, pleasure. Glad to be with you. Yeah. So, I wanted to start with, with this question. So, we've seen the stable coin market go from essentially zero uh, in, within the past five years. Uh, to over $200 billion. And other than the technology that is underpinning stable coins, in your view, is there is there anything new or novel about what is being created here or being issued from a legal perspective? Uh, what, what, what is it? Ecclesiastes once said, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, I think in many ways, uh, what has happened with stable coins and cryptocurrency markets generally uh, strike me as new technological variations on some very old themes. Uh, and uh, I th therefore, I, I, I'm essentially a financial historian. That's really my major area of interest. So I tend to look back uh, at history and see what lessons I think we can draw from past events that are similar to those that we're experiencing today and in recent years. Um, and, and so I, I, I do think based on history that I do not see cryptocurrency and stable coins as being, in a sense, different in kind from what uh, we've observed before. Uh, certainly different technologies, uh, different speeds. Uh, and I think, of course, some people think that speed uh, is wonderful, that faster is always better. Um, I tend to be a, a believer that faster is not always better. Uh, and uh, it's for that reason, I don't drive 90 or 100 miles an hour on, on highways and, and wouldn't like it if suddenly the speed limit were raised to 90 or 100 miles an hour. Um, so I, I do think that there are some very important analogies and parallels that can be drawn between today's crypto markets and stablecoin markets and what we've seen in the past in, in, in financial markets. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I acknowledge that my perspective is not the same as uh, that of others, and, and uh, um, therefore my perspective is very much informed by history and the parallels that I see. So this isn't the first time that we've had private money, uh, but the United States has been in a, a regime of monopolized uh, public money for, uh, I guess, over a, just over 100 years now. Um, so, w what is it about private money that uh, I guess is it would be an issue for you, and and how would the history of finance inform your views about that? Yeah, so I think you know we we, we can we can see you know regimes of private money, uh, particularly before the Civil War, um, and uh, then much less so un until. Uh, uh, the 1920s, and then we see a very brief period of what looks a lot like private money during the 1920s and the boom uh, of the Roaring Twenties. And then it, from 1933 to the 1970s, you're right that basically we we had no substantial private money during that period. Now, beginning in the 1970s and particularly the 1980s, we did in fact allow a new form of private money to arise, uh, the so-called shadow banking markets, which we can discuss. And I think that those markets and that private money contributed very significantly to what happened uh, in 2007 and nine during the global financial crisis. Uh, and we did not stop the creation of shadow money, sh private money uh, with the Dodd-Frank Act. We, we allowed it to continue. Uh, that would be what I would call shadow banking or or shadow deposits 1.0 or first generation. Now we're seeing, I think, in cryptocurrencies, uh, private money or shadow deposits, uh, second generation or 2.0. Hillary Allen has called it 2.0. Um, 
shadow banking 2.0. So I think if we look back a little bit at the 19th century, uh, much more at the 20th and, and early 21st century with shadow banking, and then more recently with, with cryptocurrencies, I think we can see that that private money uh, you know, allows a certain amount of dynamism, uh, but it's extremely prone, prone to boom and bust uh, cycles. Uh, and it, it tends to become uh, uncontrolled and untethered. And so the, you know, the question I have is, is the boom worth the bust? Um, I'm deeply skeptical about whether the boom is worth the bust. I think there are reasons why we actually want uh, the federal government to have monopoly control uh, over the creation of money uh, because people depend upon it so much and ordinary people really aren't able, I think, to distinguish uh, successfully between private money that is not backed by the government but that looks like real money and money that is backed by the government. And so they get caught uh, in, in ventures that are much more risky than they understood. So would you would you also agree with uh, your colleagues Gordon and Jang, who published a, a new paper recently uh, about the the need for the I guess the the sovereign uh, to maintain control of the mono, uh, monopoly on money, not only for the reasons that you listed, but yeah, also so for I, the... I would say I, I pretty much align myself with uh, Gordon and Zhang uh, and and Gordon Ross and Ross and and then some other more recent authors that mm -hmm. that uh, would indicate that. That, that private money, uh, uncontrolled by the sovereign, uh, can can be the the source of significant financial vulnerabilities and financial problems. Well, I I wanted to bring up one one point that they made about the sovereign cre or like owning essentially uh, money right. in general was that the the sovereign would have the ability to uh, 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 control the the signage. Of, of the money itself and, and retain those profits and that those profits should not be going to any sort of private uh, private actor or private issuer of money. Yes, there's been a lot of discussion about Centerage. I have to admit that I am not the expert on Centerage. Uh, from mm -hmm. what I've read, uh, I understand that Centerage, you know, may be in the range of possibly one to two percent of, of the money supply. Um, it doesn't appear to be more than 2%, but that, I, certainly that's not an insignificant number. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly would not oppose the view that um, the government ought to be accountable for Senridge as it is for any other budget item. And so uh, one might say, do we really want the Fed uh, controlling Senridge without accountability, or do we want the Treasury controlling Senridge? Shouldn't they be accountable for providing, in a sense, a, a financial accounting of what that is and what they do with it. Uh, shouldn't it be subject to normal congressional appropriation rules, for example? Um, I would not be opposed to that in the sense that I think that it's, it, it, that it's a public asset like all other public assets. And I, I'm, I'm a great believer in accountability um, for uh, public money. And uh, th therefore, you know, I, I, I wouldn't agree with those who sort of say, oh, let Treasury or Fed keep it and not really account for it. And uh, therefore, the United States citizens really wouldn't know what what magnitude of funds we're talking about or how they're being used. So I'm not in favor of of um, accountability. I mean, one reason that I think that that stable coins should be treated as deposits is that bank deposits are subject to all sorts of uh, uh, and banks themselves and owners of banks are subject mm -hmm. to all sorts of controls uh, and transparency and accountability, uh, which I think are greatly needed in this area. So I, I, I certainly do not believe that the government should be less accountable uh, than the than the financial institutions that it regulates. So, I mean, one thing that uh is pointed out about the the crypto markets or at least the the dollar crypto markets is that the the prime reason or at least the main reason that all of this came about was that there was just not enough supply in the market at the time there was there was essentially a, a dearth of stable coins people wanted to ha own dollars uh in these markets uh to essentially you know uh, have a a non-volatile asset to move out of 
from either Bitcoin or, or whichever asset they would wanted to hold. And it's, it's because of that, that a company like Tether was able to come in and be the first major stable coin to provide these dollar markets. Um, and that has continued onward. And, and now, uh, you know, Tether's essentially moved into being a, a privatized Euro dollar substitute. And, and now we're seeing, um, domestic U S based stable coins come about like USDC and Paxos, uh, which are, uh, setting themselves up in a way which is providing a sit, uh, hopefully more transparency than what Tether is doing. Uh, it looks like they've been doing that based on the disclosures that they've been making. Um, and uh, you've seen a, a shift in, uh, in people that have used to hold Tether. I think USDC has uh, come close or is, is soon to be uh, flipping Tether in the amount of uh, circulating supply. Uh, that's actually being held. Uh, so it seems that people actually, you know, I, I, you said before that people can't make the distinction between like good or, or bad money. They, they wouldn't really know, right? So in this case, more people have started to move towards these U.S. domestic uh, options and alternatives. Uh, and they probably like what USDC has done. I mean, they look at what Coinbase, the connection there, uh, you know, Circle used to be part of uh, JP Morgan, and then it was spun off. Uh, so I guess all these things would lend into people having confidence within that. Um, is this the is this the right path for these stable coins to be taking, or is this just not enough in your perspective for them to be um, slowly? Because even Circle, right? Even Circle used to have a a it, oh, coming back to like the books, right? So no, excluding Tether and just focusing on Circle, they used to have a a, a portfolio of collateral that was diverse. They would have like Yankee CDs, they had short-term securities, uh, they had commercial paper on there. Uh, but as they've grown and as they've had, uh, I guess, more people looking at them, regulators and uh, other people demanding for more transparency, they've shifted their collateral base into more uh, short-term securities, notes, uh, treasury notes uh, to, I guess, show that their, uh, their, their asset basket that they hold would be something that a... Uh, U.S. based investor or uh, institution or uh, re retail uh, customer would want to use. So, it, would that be the right framing, or uh, is there something more that needs to be done uh, for these stablecoin issuers uh, to bring them in to, uh, I guess, regulatory or or legal uh, compliance? In your view, right. So, I, th I mean, I think you raised a number of good questions there, which is the USDC model, the Circle model. Uh, this so-called center consortium model uh, with 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 Coinbase, you know, seems to be emerging as sort of the market choice because uh, investors, uh, I think you're right, over the past two years have shown more and more interest in uh, the use of stable coins as sort of uh, stable value tokens for trading. Uh, in crypto markets and and, and uh, lending them out in crypt crypto transactions, uh, Tether has been the subject of a lot of negative publicity and a lot of questions about what assets they actually have. Uh, they suffer they've su they suffered uh, a loss of over ten billion dollars uh, of stable coins as people sort of cashed out. Um, so I think it is useful to look at at, at the circle model and say, well. A is it is it better than the alternative, uh, which is which is sort of a tether-like model, or or even worse, a Terra-like model. Uh, and secondly, is it good enough? So I think it certainly is better than the tether model because, as you say, they seem to be moving toward uh, mainly having their their reserves in uh, FDIC-insured bank deposits and uh, treasuries. Uh, it's not. I haven't gone to any kind of deconstruction to see exactly what treasuries they hold. Uh, according to reports that I hear, uh, the draft House bill that may or may not come out pretty soon seems to be saying that they would require stablecoin issuers to have essentially their money either in, in FDIC-insured uh, bank deposits, um, very short-term repo agreements, repurchase agreements backed by treasuries with maturities of not more than 90 days with the repos of seven days or less and the or to hold treasury securities themselves uh, not more than 90 days um, that would look a lot 
like sort of a government money market fund. So I view that model as sort of a, a sort of a government money market fund model. And so one could say, okay, how well has a government money market fund model worked? Um, I think it works a lot better than an alternative like like Tether or even worse, Terra, where there, there's really it's very unclear how much liquidity is behind or how much real value is behind these things. Uh, certainly Tether has some real liquidity issues and Terra had some real basic solvency issues. Um, but the government money market fund industry has not been free of problems. Uh, there were certainly, uh, there was a bailout in 2008. Again, the, the problems were worse in the prime money market, which is the non-government money market area. But, but, but government money market funds were protected by that bailout. And then in 2020, in March 2020, essentially the treasury market froze up uh, and, and people simply couldn't get access to their money locked up in treasury. So there was a run on, again, both prime and government money market funds. They were bailed out again. And the, gov and, and the Fed basically had to bail out the treasury market. Now, why did that occur? Uh, I think we're still deconstructing it, but it appears that a couple of factors uh, were, maybe two or three factors were at work. One is the size of the treasury market has expanded tremendously as the government has issued more and more debt. So we're now up to somewhere around 120% of federal GDP and government debt, which is an amount we have not seen since World War II. It's an immense pile of government debt. Now, some of that is locked up in the Social Security Medicare system, but you know, probably at least 90 to 100% sits you know, in, in the markets. Um, so we have a much greater pile of federal debt to deal with. Secondly, uh, the, the major dealers, which are the big banks, the so-called primary dealers, have shown much less interest in, in maintaining large portfolios of treasury debt. They complain that it's too expensive because of capital requirements, but for whatever reason, they're, they're not really fulfilling their job. They're not really, you know, primary dealer is supposed to stand ready at any time to buy or sell treasuries. And they, and they were not able or willing to do that in March 2020. And the Fed and the Treasury had to step in and bail out the Treasury market and the and the money market fund market. And then a lot of the a lot of the money uh, sorry a lot of the Treasuries now are held by non banks that are not primary dealers, money market mm -hmm. funds, hedge funds, uh, other you know non bank non primary dealer entities, and and they're very lightly regulated. Uh, they're not they don't have much capital. So I think what we're seeing is the Treasury market itself is much less reliable than it used to be. Um, now, if, if everybody was holding seven-day treasuries, that's pretty liquid. 90-day treasuries are not super liquid. So the House, if, the, if that's what the House is going to propose, a, a limit on 90-day treasuries, that to me sets up a liquidity problem. If you look at extreme short uh, ETFs holding uh, government securities, they've lost value in the last month. I mean, the, the, the treasury markets are taking a pounding. Now, not as bad as other markets. I mean, look at what's happening to the British pound. Okay, so right. if you were holding, you know, British gilts right now, UK gilts, since the UK government treasury bonds, you would be taking a bath. Um, now, so the, the, what, I'm, what I'm making, what, the point I'm making is, even government bonds are not risk-free, uh, particularly in times of severe financial disruptions and crisis, which where everybody sort of panics and runs for cash, uh, and they even want to dump treasuries. And as I say, we bailed out the money market funds twice. I think the current conditions in government bond markets uh, raise significant questions about what's going to happen. Um, I used to tell my students when I was teaching that the U.S., you know, was viewed as the safest, you know, place to put your money in terms of government bonds because we happen to be the best-looking horse in the glue factory. You know, we the, the, the U.S. debt I think is unsustainable and at a very dangerous point. But it just so happens that the EU and the U.K. and the and China and Japan and our other major competitors are even worse off than we are. Um, but I, I said to my students, you know, if we ever become the second or third best looking horse in the glue factory, we're in for trouble. Um, 
And so um, that's why I think that money market regulation, although it's better than what we have, because basically we have nothing in this in the stable coin market. So w would money market fund regulation be better than nothing? Yes. But would it be sufficient or adequate? My view is no, because in a financial crisis uh, where everybody panics, basically only the sovereign can can provide uh, liquidity and solvency assurance at that point. Now, again, there might come a time when the U.S. can't even do that, uh, at which point Katie bar the door. But at least so long as people are willing to believe in the dollar and, and, and uh, to hold Treasury bills at all, uh, the government can step in and, and, and provide solvency. My concern is that where we're talking about money, and, and I believe that people would look at circle stable coins uh, as money, just as they look at money market funds, especially government money market funds as money. Uh, I think that's incorrect and shouldn't be allowed, but that's what that's where we are. If, if, if people look at that as money, they believe the government will step in to protect it. And my view is if that's the belief, the government will step in in the last resort and protect it as they did with money market funds in 2000 and 2020, then my belief is we're kidding ourselves if we don't regulate it as sovereign protected money now. Uh, we can talk about why that makes sense as bank deposits. Uh, bank deposits are sovereign protected and we regulate banks accordingly because it's sovereign protected. I think to believe that we don't have to do that now when everybody believes that when push comes to shove and when a crisis comes like March 2020 or October 2008 or September 2008, we believe that then the government will step in. Then my view is we, we need to regulate these things now uh, with that assumption in mind. Yeah. You know, I would I would love to have a, uh, a CBDC issued on any of these crypto networks, which is would be similar to USDC, have the same components. Uh, and that was, you know, fully backed by the, the faith of the government as a, as a essentially um, issued dollar from the central bank. I, I would love that. But I just don't think that will ever happen because of the uh, perceived, um, I guess, around the perception of, of what these, these networks are, or just in, in the general broader sense. You know, from, from what I've seen of kind of a temperature check of the industry, you know, the Fed's kind of dragged its heels on these CBDC issues. I mean, the, the, the Fed papers that I've seen have talked about issuing a, a test case in two years or three years. And so I think the, the Fed is, is almost deferring to private companies, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, yeah. to, to handle this as a public, as a, as a essentially private solution with public support. Uh, and, and so I just don't think that the the best case in, in having this kind of tokenized CBDC that's issued out, I just don't think it's going to come about. And I don't really see uh, companies like the, the government. I don't think the government's going to compete in that area. And so, you know, the these secondary alternatives like using USDC or if, you know, PayPal steps in or some of the other ones, uh, uh, you know, large payment providers step in, I think that will probably be the like de facto way of of handling uh private money going forward uh and and like you said i mean there may be consequences to that uh for good or for bad but it just seems that from the the fed side they're unwilling to pursue uh, a solution like the like the europeans do i mean the europeans have uh, is it sepa yeah the europeans have sepa which is a, a amazing payment rail it's pretty incredible what they've built there. And we, we just don't have that in, this, in the United States. We have this hodgepodge of financial payment systems uh, connected by all sorts of, you know, strings and, you know, technologies in different, in many different states uh, and many different banks and private institutions. And we just don't have this like unified singular payment rail. Uh, so what, what would like on a broader, cause I, I know, I know we'll talk about stable coins in the kind of the broader scope because they're not just limited to crypto networks. I mean, Facebook wanted to uh, enter into this uh, stable coin arena. I know that PayPal has been thinking about it as well too. You know, a right. lot of these big commercial companies are trying to figure out, okay, how can we provide payment rails 
for the future. And they're trying to like solve these issues. And, you know, they're looking at it from a technological perspective of saying like, you know, we, we can design these highly competitive payment systems that are great for our customers. And, you know, we've got the best engineers, the best developers and the best designers who can make this the, the best user experience for our, our customers and that they'll come to us. And, and through the, the, um, quality of our product, we will then generate our business that way and attract new customers through there. Um, so what, what is the solution going forward here? If the government is dragging its feet and relying on kind of this, uh, private solution, uh, to handle the, the future of our payment systems. Right. So I, th I think I'm very concerned about PayPal. I see PayPal as another source of private money that is trying to get bigger. They already, last I knew, have over $40 billion of customer balances, which are not FDIC insured, not insured by anybody. Uh, the reserves are not anything like what Circle is holding, from what I can tell. Uh, they're, they're holding some long-term paper against those $40 billion of customer receive, uh, balances. So I think PayPal is another example of private money that needs to be regulated. Now, it's interesting, the Fed, you know, the Fed has announced that they're going to go live with FedNow, which is their instant payment uh, uh, network for all banks, uh, beginning essentially less than a year from now, sometime in 2023. Um, just to make clear, that's a, um, a wholesale... A bank to bank instant Yeah, so payment. it's a, it's a wholesale payment system. So, right. It's not, a, it's not a tokenized dollar that the... Uh, central bank is right. providing to its customers. It's a it's, it's an account based wholesale it's system. A, it's yeah. a bank clearing uh, system that will basically provide instant payments bank to bank. I think that's a very significant development now, uh, and, and I think it'll be really important to see how well that works. Uh, the the J P Morgan big bank uh, uh, instant payment system is already up and going, and. Uh, I, I haven't seen any signs of huge hiccups, but again, it's just bank to bank. Now that 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 leaves, I think, some important gaps. One is, how do we get instant payments, or at least very close to instant payments, to customers? And I would note that <laughs> stable coins are <laughs> far, far away from anything looking at instant payments. I mean, long delay times and long big fees to to get it in and out. But let's say you know. Fed now exists. We have instant bank to bank payments. How do we get that to customers? I think that's a big issue. Secondly, how do we get how do we get bank uh, I'm sorry customer access to banks, particularly for customers who are have not traditionally dealt with banks or are reluctant to deal with banks? Now, I believe again two sides of the coin. I believe that banks should be the monopoly regulated providers of money, which to me includes payments, but then they, they need to be regulated in a way much like utilities. And so if, if customers can't get access to banks on reasonable terms, that's a problem. And it seems to me that's the quid pro quo for the banks. If you want to be in the money supply business and the payments business, you have to be in the accessibility business and the convenience business. And uh, I think the Fed ha absolutely has a responsibility to provide reasonable access uh, and, 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 and reasonable uh, convenience in terms of getting payments, you know, from customers to banks and to other customers. Um, and if that's not happening, it needs it needs to happen. Uh, the, the problem I see is that, as you say, I don't see this hodgepodge of private initiatives leading to a good result, whereas a, a unified bank payment system uh, which I think would probably involve tokenized bank deposits, I think is very promising. Now, you, you raise a good question. Why don't we just cut out the banks and go to a central bank digital currency? We could do that. I think banks would then become essentially at most subcontractors. They would take money from the Fed uh, and lend it out. But I, for myself, I'm a, I'm a free market guy within reason and i i have really i have doubts about whether the government's very good at allocating credit so it would worry me if the fed gets all the money from customers and then the fed either directly or indirectly through subcontracting banks decides who gets the money in terms of credit i think that's problematic i think in terms of privacy it's problematic because 
if it's a CBDC, presumably the, the the federal government now knows, you know, who's who's doing what with the money because they control it, they own it. And now China went that way. China has a CBDC for obvious reasons. They want to know what every person in China is doing with their money. Uh, that worries me considerably. So I see two significant reasons to have to retain a banking system where the banks essentially supply the money uh, under regulation by the Fed uh, and with with accountability to the Fed and to the Congress and to the people. I think it, it helps retain privacy. And I think it I, I, I would rather see the credit allocation business be decentralized as opposed to centralized. So some of my colleagues are, are much more comfortable with the Fed allocating credit uh, or the or the federal government, the Treasury. I'm not. Um, but I do think that unless the Fed and the Treasury control who can have money in terms of the banks, you know, who can create money and, and, and how the payment system is run, uh, I'm like you. I think it's going to be very problematic. Now, I have one other thing to say, which is if we don't limit money and payments to the banks, Inevitably, big tech is going to get into this space. We've seen it in China. They, they got in big time. I mean, basically, uh, Tencent and Alibaba, uh, uh, Alipay, they controlled essentially the payment system in China until suddenly the, the, the Xi Jinping regime decided that's way too much power and they cracked down on them. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that big tech could make a huge entry into, into payments and banking in this country if we don't prevent it. Right now, the Bank Holding Company Act says you can't own a bank if you're a commercial company. Uh, so big tech can't own banks. I think that's a separation worth maintaining because I actually don't want big tech knowing everything about people's finances or big tech allocating credit for many of the same reasons I don't want government doing it either. I think I think concentrated power, uh, particularly concentrated power over information and data is very dangerous. So that's another reason for me wanting this to be happening within the banks and with regulated bank holding companies, because big tech can't own banks. If we allow non-banks to get in this space, then big tech's going to get in. And pretty soon, they're going to have so much control that they will be able to break down any barriers between commerce and banking they they will they you you'll see mergers between you know Amazon and Citigroup or JP Morgan and Microsoft and I don't look upon that prospect uh, as being in any way encouraging or appetizing so you're one of the foremost experts on the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 which separated commercial banking investment banking and insurance right what did banking or when we when we look at these big tech firms and them wanting to get into the the money creation space what historical precedent was there from the pre-1930s of commercial firms entering the banking space and and what results did it lead to right so there uh there were some commercial firms that got into banking uh you know Episodically during our country's history, but particularly during the, the, the 19s and 20s. And it, from my point of view, uh, the, the history is, 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 is not favorable. Uh, there, there was a big um, finance and industrial conglomerate, uh, for example, in, in, in Nashville, Tennessee, that basically controlled uh, it, industrial firms, insurance companies, banks, securities firms. Uh, it was called Caldwell and Company. And it, it, it controlled them throughout the whole southeastern United States, not including Florida, but covering most everything else from from the from the Ohio River south and the Mississippi River east. And Caldwell and Company in many ways was a pyramid pyramid scheme. They used uh, their banks uh, to, to underwrite unsound bonds for the industrial companies. They had all their industrial companies, uh, you know, put their deposits in their affiliated banks, and the banks took extreme risks. When Caldwell and Company collapsed uh, in 1930, it basically brought down the economy 
of the whole southeastern region, again, not not including Florida, maybe not including Georgia, but including most of the rest of the southeast. And it, it, it really set off what was really the first great banking crisis of the Great Depression in the United States. Um, so I think that's that's a very troubling precedent. And then after World War II, the Glass-Steagall Act, you're right, separated banks from the securities markets and and largely from insurance as well. Uh, and I think we, we could discuss why I think that that was a very good thing, why we had so much stability up until the 1980s because of it, uh, why we should think about doing it, very much think about doing it again. But there was a period uh, up until nine, the 1956 when uh, the Glass-Steagall Act itself had didn't directly push commercial companies out of banking. And so there was a, a company called Transamerica, which was a very big company in the western part of the United States and, and for a while controlled Bank of America. Um, that company, again, had many industrial uh, firms, insurance companies, a number of banks. Uh, it spun off Bank of America due to a sort of an internal corporate fight, but it main, still maintained seven or eight other large banks. Um, and, and the Fed got very concerned about it and tried to shut it down basically on antitrust grounds, which failed. Uh, as Transamerica and other firms got big, uh, Congress got concerned and they stepped in with the Bank Holding Company Act of 1956 and separated commerce and banking. So I think that there's no doubt that commercial firms have seen the advantage of having sort of a house bank that they can draw upon for credit and for funding. And uh, there are conflicts of interest involved in that, and there's risk taking involved in that. Uh, one could look at, for example, GMAC, which was allowed to combine commerce and banking through another loophole. And GMAC, uh, ended up being one of the largest bailouts uh, of, of 2008. It was uh, 140, no, it's about a $200 billion company, and it ended up getting about 30 or $40 billion worth of bailouts um, because it combined commerce and banking in very risky ways. So I think we, we could talk about European examples. There are many examples in Europe of similar things. Um, I think mixing commerce and banking basically destroys the objectivity of bank lending it it you know it puts a lot of eggs into fewer baskets and uh, then when those baskets fall and break uh, the the results are, are are very are very bad so um it's interesting nature if you look at how natural systems evolve they tend to involve segmentation and multiplicity there's a reason we have two eyes and two ears and two arms and two legs you know that the systems tend to be multiple systems and you don't tend to see nature combining everything into one big lump and then saying, okay, everything rises or falls based upon this. We humans seem to keep thinking that putting everything together into one place, uh, you know, bigger is always better. More complex is always better. I just don't think that nature or history support that view. And, uh, uh, I think we should do our best to sort of keep things segmented into into more areas so that if if one area gets in trouble, it doesn't bring down the entire financial system, and the entire economy. Yeah, I mean, I'm I worry about uh, Facebook and and other companies it, uh, entering the banking space, mostly for the same reasons that you do on the, the surveillance aspect. I mean, they've proven to be uh, poor actors when handling people's data, uh, especially after the, the kind of events of 2016 came about, uh, when you know, this data was being used by third party companies uh, to essentially build customer profiles that then could be exploited for various ways. Right. So they were throwing, monetizing that data. Yeah. Right. So now you throw in mo money into the mix and now you have a direct line for advertisers to work with Google and Facebook right. To then and, and uh, now you know everything about it. you right. know everything about everybody's data. Then I mean, if you, if you can see their financial profile, you can figure out almost everything that people are doing essentially. Right, paired with paired with all the data that they're collecting. Otherwise, they already they, have right. Right, yeah, and so like the the thing that would scare me the most is if those companies uh, get 
I, I guess, full stack banking system included into their uh, companies. And then there's, you know, again, data sharing agreements that are passed on to the government. I mean, I, that would that would be very scary because then you have this almost working towards a, um, you know, like fascism is the is the merging of, yes. of corporate and state power. And and that you would know, be you know, that, that. Yeah. If and you so go that back for to me, the history that, of the 1950s, yeah, yeah. the Banking mm -hmm. Holding Company Act of 1956 as amended in 1970, and you look at the congressional debates, they focused very much on the German industrial cartels and banking cartels as they combined with the Nazi regime and the Japanese so-called, at that time, Zaibatsu, which were essentially industrial and financial cartels that combined with the imperial government of Japan, the fascist government of Japan, and they absolutely believed that that concentration of economic and financial power supported concentrated dictatorial political power. And they said, we do not want this in the United States. We do not want to see industrial and financial cartels arising that could be so powerful that they could support a political system like the ones that you saw in Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. We don't want that here. Um, so I think you're right. I think there's very there are very good reasons historically to not want that kind of system. Would the hybrid be then that in like integrations of uh, wallets where users hold their own funds? I mean, essentially like what we have with crypto wallets today, where if somebody sends me USDC, I mean, I have that wallet in my uh, in my control. Uh, I could use a hosting service like Facebook who could provide me the security architecture so that my private keys stay safe, but I would still have full control over that. Would that, would that almost be the, the best option if they're trying to integrate these crypto payment systems, or would that still be essentially providing banking services? Of course, you've got one other countervailing problem, which is we, you know, the, the, that uh, the, the, the Bank Secrecy Act, the Anti-Money Laundering Acts, the, the Anti-Terrorist Financing Acts, you know, we're not comfortable now with people being completely private, right, about their finances. Um, mm -hmm. so to me, the banking system, you know, is a, is a balancing point because the banks have significant privacy duties and significant privacy concerns, but they have to report to the government when they see large volumes of money moving that are unexplained, right? Why is someone moving 20 or 30 or 50 or a hundred thousand dollars? <coughs> we at least have to report that to the government. And then the government can decide, is that something we need to flag or not? Um, a lot of the, I think, the inherent problems of DeFi, as I understand them, and I'm not an expert on DeFi, but what I've read about it is, you know, people are, 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 are trying to not let the government see large movements of money, and, and, and DeFi can help them do that. But I think, as you've seen in the Tornado Cash episode, the government is saying, look, if we see people deliberately trying to keep their money hidden and private and move it around without our seeing it, and there are large amounts of money moving around and it's being hidden from us, we are, we're going to step in. So, I mean, this is a very dynamic balance because I'm, I'm a privacy oriented guy, but I understand that, you know, people can use privacy for bad reasons. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a regulatory guy, but I think you know, regulation can be used for bad reasons. So, I mean, my view is that the banking system with all its flaws has been the product of really, you know, at least I think significant experimentation and, and, and revision, particularly since 1933. Uh, you could argue since 1913 with the Federal Reserve System. I mean, it, it, you know, we, it's, it's an iterative process uh, over time and my view is the people who basically say, let's escape the banking system, run around it, let's let's not do have anything to do with it, you know, why would we think that all that accumulated wisdom should be discarded? I mean, again, if there were no money market bailouts, you know, if there were if there were no crypto crashes, if there were no problems, then I would say, well, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, maybe there isn't a good case for regulation, but every time people try to end run regulation, we see crashes and bailouts. Uh, in the 1920s, they they allowed the securities markets to run wild, uh, and and they they had what were called call money market loans, which were a lot like repo 
repo loans. And they allowed those to explode. And then they contributed to this enormous crash that brought on the Great Depression. So I read that in your is, I read, sorry, you know, I read that in your book, but weren't those weren't those call loans that was the central bank lending to these large banks? So they were called brokers call loans. So basically, yes. you know, they were kind of like margin loans like we have now, but but they regulated margin loans after 1933. So now you if you have a margin loan, you can't borrow more than 50 percent of the uh, market value of, 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 of the securities that are in the account collateralizing the loan. So mm -hmm. you can't leverage, you can only leverage two to one. And if you leverage two to one, you're gonna get margin calls, right? So sort of what happened uh, right. that essentially the, 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 the call loans then were highly leveraged, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 times in some cases. And so when the crash came, then you had this enormous liquidation of collateral at very low values. I mean, it was a it was a downward spiral. Uh, again, a liquidity and a solvency, a liquidity panic that turned into a solvency panic. The New York Fed actually stepped in and made emergency loans that prevented the the call loan market from completely collapsing to zero. Uh, but there, there again, the federal government and the Fed were pretty limited in what they did. So that I think I mentioned that. The New York Stock Exchange lost about 90 percent of its value between 1929 and 1932. And a lot of that was due to the high degree of leverage and high degree of loans that were taken out against what appeared to be, you know, can't miss, can't lose earnings uh, from the stock market run up. Um, and so, you know, with 90 percent losses, any individual institution, including banks that were holding major positions in, in, in the securities markets and bonds, bonds were not hurt 90 percent, but they were probably hurt 50 to 70 percent. Um, it just wiped out, you know, millions of investors, uh, institutions and banks. Um, so I think that that, uh, again, these these kinds of uh, regulatory restrictions on leverage and risk taking have been proven over and over to be really important. And I think we were mentioning that, you know, the Archegos collapse, which cost over $10 billion to leading financial institutions. I mean, you have to ask, you know, why was uh, Archegos and Bill Huang, why, why weren't they resp uh, required to meet some kind of limitations on margin? In other words, if, if this is good for individual investors, why isn't it good for hedge funds and family offices and other, you know, risky investors. In other words, I think it's a black mark uh, on our regulatory system that that Archegos could take those kinds of positions essentially through derivatives uh, and 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 not not be prevented from doing that. Yeah. So I, I wanted to come back to something that we were talking about earlier in the um, discussion, which was uh, the collapse of the money market funds in 2008 and uh, in 2020. Right. Looking specifically at 2008, um, what what were the reasons behind the collapse of those money markets? From from what I understand, you had uh, the banks who were securitizing these MBSs just at the at the top level, right? Uh, and then those right. AAA MBSs uh, were then lent out uh, in either repos or, or other things to the money yes. markets as collateral, and from from my understanding of the collapse of the money markets, it wasn't so much as an issue with the money markets themselves. It was a question of the, of the collateral that they were holding. So I, I'm not, you can probably inform me. I don't know if they were holding those CDOs, uh, which were like the, the triple B and the things, but the- It's the, possible that they were holding some triple A strips of CDOs. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're right. Mainly they were holding triple A, triple A and possibly even down to triple B strips of, of, of uh, RMBS, of subprime yeah. RMBS. Um, I don't think they were all triple A's, but uh, they were certainly significantly exposed uh, to triple, you know, to, to, to mortgage backed securities that were essentially subprime. Right. Uh, and then, and then and what so happened was the, that, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, just to, just to explain a bit more. So when, when the collapse of happened, then, or at least they were the also investor, investing it, in commercial paper, yeah. They, they were issued, so when the, when the much of the commercial paper had been issued by people like Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, 
mm -hmm. uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, major banking corporations. So uh, the money market funds were holding a lot of commercial paper. And what, what happened first was that the government allowed Lehman to fail. Lehman went bankrupt. Lehman defaulted on all its commercial paper. And it turned mm -hmm. out that the very first money market fund ever to be organized, the so-called primary reserve fund, was holding something like $800 million worth of Lehman oh, wow. commercial paper, which suddenly all became worthless mm -hmm. overnight. Yeah. So prim primary reserve was the first one to break the buck. Um, and of course, at the same time, you were having kind of a run on the on the repos uh, that people that the money market funds no longer wanted to roll over their repos that were backed, especially by you know subprime RMBS. Um, I think there were you know the ma the major problem was in the non-government money market funds. There was some trouble in 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 the treasury side, not as much. Now what I can what I can read about the March 2020 episode is actually there, the tre treasury market froze along mm. with everything else uh, because everybody was trying to get cash. Now, what, what also happens in a, in a so-called a fire sale pack panic, and this was somewhat true in 2008 as well, when a fire sale occurs and you cannot liquidate your risky stuff like commercial paper uh, or you know subprime RMBS uh, strips, if you can't liquidate that, you go to what you can liquidate, which is things like treasury bills, especially short-term right. treasury bills. But if everybody is trying to sell treasury bills to liquidate and, and get cash to pay off the stuff that they can't liquidate, essentially, and nobody is wanting to buy, then even in short-term treasuries, you have a problem because everybody's trying to sell and nobody's trying to buy. Um, everybody wants cash and nobody wants even short-term treasuries. So there were some problems even then in 2008, even in the treasury market. It seems to have been even more intense in 2020 because so many of the treasuries were not being held by primary dealers, but were being held by hedge funds and other leveraged investors that were desperate to get cash from anything. And so everybody was trying to dump even treasuries in the market. And the primary dealers, as I said, who were supposed to be standing ready to buy the treasury said, not us, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not us. And, the, and, and and I think the reason they said not us is they knew the Fed and the treasury would step in to, to bail out the market because they had done it in 2008. Um, so my, pro my problem is the more that we expect that the government is going to step in and bail out, things that are not really bank deposits, things that we thought were not really money, but they were shadow money, Mm -hmm. The more the more people start creating more and more shadow money because they say, well, the Fed did it twice now. They'll certainly do it a third time. But of course, at what point does the amount of shadow money, unregulated money, uh, become so large that maybe even the Fed can't bail it out? I mean, that's kind of what we're seeing now in more and more countries, right? That that look at look at uh, UK. I think people now believe, hey, can the UK really pay off? A, all the debt they have, and, and B, all the debt they just said they're going to take on to finance this new stimulus program the new government wants to do. We're not sure that they can actually pay it off. So we're, you know, we're dumping, we're dumping UK bonds that supposedly were, you know, very safe instruments. Uh, so, so does that lead to like a situation that, that you, you had in Cyprus where the banking system collapsed? Yeah, Cyprus, exactly. And you, they thought they, that they could, Cyprus couldn't save the banks, right? And in the end, Cyprus required the depositors to take a 50% haircut. Can you imagine if you lost 50% yeah. of your bank deposits? It's amazing. I mean, Cyprus got a lot of help from uh, both the EU and the IMF that sort of muddled through. But, you know, that's what happened in the Great Depression, that people lost, you know, 30, 50, even 70% of their bank deposits because nobody stepped in to back them up. Now, Essentially, what got us out of the depression was in 1933, you know, when Roosevelt came in, Roosevelt and the new Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was essentially a, a bailout fund, and the Fed got together and said, OK, you know, we're basically going to step in and backstop the deposits in all banks that we believe are solvent. And for those we think are not solvent, we're going to protect as many deposits as we can. But but we're going to basically say we're going to reopen the banks and we're going to stand behind their solvency. If we say they're solvent, they're not going to fail. And so 
people were willing to, you know, people were willing to bring their money back out of the mattresses and out of the holes in the ground and put them back in banks again. Um, I don't know if you have time for this, but there's a very funny story that's kind of a legend that uh, this 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 bank was was foreclosing on, on, on farmer and put it up for auction. And this farmer and his wife came in to, to bid on it. Uh, and the farmer put down a big bag of cash and they counted through it and they said, this isn't quite enough. You know, it's only maybe 70 or 80% of what need, you need to pay to buy this, this farm. <laughs> the farmer turned to the wife and said, you brought the wrong bag of cash. <laughs> in other words, the, the farmer had multiple bags of cash. He wasn't keeping it in the banks, right? It was all on the ground somewhere. And of course, what, what Roosevelt and the Fed and the Treasury did and the Reconstruction of Finance Corporation, how do we get the money out of the mattresses and back into the banks? But people won't do it unless they think the banks are, are completely sound, right? They're not going to lose money that they put into banks. So even banks can fail unless the sovereign truly says they're not going to fail. My concern is that's hard enough with the banks. Once we start going outside the banks into shadow banks of various types, and leading people to believe that they're going to be backed up, even though they're not regulated, I think we're in for trouble uh, at that point. So how would you address the problems of too big to fail? Because this seems to be a, an ever-growing issue um, as markets become bigger. Yes. You know, yes. We, we have the creation Huge. of new de- these new derivative markets now, which only right. magnify the risk of, of any losses to these uh Banks, right? Especially the primary primary right. dealer banks, uh, which you know, God forbid, a so, JP Morgan, you know, we, or, right. we or have, Goldman. We improved yeah. derivatives regulation, but but we probably didn't go far enough. So again, what seems to have happened with the Archegos is that we were regulating um, uh, commodities and 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 uh, energy related derivatives, but we weren't we weren't regulating securities related derivatives long enough. The SEC should have had securities related derivatives clearing and, and, and reporting requirements in place, which they did not at the time of the Archegos collapse. Now, I think since then, Gary Gensler has, got, has gotten those rules out, but it's, it's really pretty distressing that more than 10 years after Dodd-Frank, uh, the securities derivatives rules were not in place to stop Archegos from doing what it did. Um, but the too big to fail is a, is a major issue because look look at J.P. Morgan Chase. What are they now? Three and a half trillion dollars. Nobody thinks they're going to be allowed to fail or any of the other, you know, probably 20 largest banks. And it's really not the 10 largest. So my view is we need to make, make banks a lot more complicated and a lot, I mean, a lot less complicated and a lot less big. One way to do that would be to say, J.P. Morgan, you can be a bank. But you can't be a securities underwriter or dealer, and you can't be a derivatives dealer. Um, you know, capital market stuff needs to be done separately from banking, um, and people have to believe that capital market stuff is not going to be always protected 100 cents in the dollar if if a problem comes. Um, so I think that you know what we've said. I call it we've bankified our entire financial markets by allowing the banks to own everything in the financial markets. And now we're threatening to bankify our entire economy if we allow commercial firms to own banks or to get into the banking business. We've got to stop bankifying things. We need to say if it's a bank, which basically makes deposits, you know, takes deposits, makes loans, provides trust services, provides wealth management advice, that's protected. But if it's capital markets where you're basically, you know, betting on the movement of prices for equity and debt securities or derivatives, uh, you know, we would, pre- we would prevent a cataclysmic collapse, but we're not protecting people hundred cents in the dollar anymore. Uh, that might actually bring some market discipline back into our capital markets. And if it's commerce, you know, we keep that separate, you know, from, from uh, finance, because I think the more we allow this conglomeration, the more than, the conglomerates know that oh the federal safety net just keeps you know extending and extending and wrapping around everything and then then it becomes kind of a a, a chumps game to me because the, the the little small business won't be bailed out as we saw you know during the pandemic or during the global financial crisis they will be allowed to fail but the great big conglomerates will be protected 
that that to me produces an economy that is way too concentrated, way too controlled by the by the big powers, uh, and doesn't work for the ordinary person. So my view is let's let's make our economy more segmented, more divided. Let's keep let's make banking the servant of the economy rather than the master of the economy. Um, it's funny that they used to call it the financial services industry when I started out, which was the idea that, you know, finance is serving the rest of us. And then along the way, the, the word services dropped out. They just talk about it as being the banking industry or the banking or the finance financial industry. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> we're the ones being served now by the rest of you. And I think that makes no sense at all. Right. Yeah. That, that banking to me should be a service and, and should be regulated as such. Uh, it's really a franchise, as, as some of my colleagues have said. It's, it's a franchise provided by the government with lots of privileges, but with lots of obligations. Mm -hmm. So when the banks tell me that, oh, we can't provide checking accounts to people, you know, who are basically, you know, they're, they're, they're not bad credit risks, right? They just can't afford all the fees and minimums and so on. And it's like, I understand if you don't provide a banking service to someone who's declared bankruptcy a couple or three times and hasn't built up their credit. But for someone who has a job or has an income and, you know, has not been defaulting right and left, they should be able to get a banking account. And my view is if, if the banks won't do it voluntarily, then that's something the government needs to make happen. I, I hate to see people say, well, because we can't get bank accounts, let's create something outside the banking industry that will do you know, kind of a substitute, but then it won't be regulated, won't be protected, won't be overseen in the same way that banks are overseen. Um, so I think that the, the problems of ex accessibility and convenience, to me, should be corrected within the banking system. Now, I'm, I'm a great believer in thinking we need more banks. You know, why aren't we chartering more uh, community-related institutions? We shouldn't have just a few big guys at the top. I mean, I'd like to see a lot more smaller guys at the bottom uh, who are actually serving their local communities and not just serving, you know, big multinationals. Yeah. So, so I, I really, I'm, the... I'm a, you, you can see I'm a very traditional guy, but I think the traditional notion of banking that was kind of the, the notion between the 1930s and 1980s uh, made a lot of sense. And, mm -hmm. and we didn't have all we didn't have any major systemic financial crises during that period, which I think hmm. tells us something. Would this be um, the, with with the growth of like post World War II uh, banking issues? Would any of it stem from the parallel growth of the euro dollar system and and the growth of the dollar yes. as the reserve yes. currency internationally? Yes, definitely. You know, dollars. You know, escaped. Right. They, they escaped the U.S. system and were created abroad. Part of that was due to uh, the whole petrodollar uh, uh, phenomenon where we were paying a lot of money to the Middle Eastern countries and other oil producers for their oil. And then they needed to put their dollars somewhere and they tended to put them back into foreign branches of U.S. banks. Um, so, you know, it's interesting one thing that clearly broke down in Glass-Steagall that I think probably can't be recreated is they tried to create interest rate limits, right? The old Reg mm -hmm. Q, where they limited how much you got paid on your deposit account and how much uh, could be charged on you know, certain types of loans. And I think that kind of price control strikes me as probably not feasible. Um, but I do believe that you know, we have to take seriously that... Uh, Again, the banks can't simply park dollars, you know, abroad and say, "Oh well, now, now, now we don't have to be regulated the same way right. uh, doing business abroad as we do when we do business in the United States." Now, okay, maybe, obviously, I, I realize that consumer protection would be much more focused on what the host country wants for consumer protection, but in terms of safety and stability and soundness and what you allow banks to do. I think you have to be very concerned with what kind of risks they're taking abroad. Uh, banks got into a lot of trouble in the 1970s and 80s by making a lot of bad, you know, foreign loans uh, that they shouldn't have been allowed to make. Uh, so you're right. I mean, if we're going to be the global financial center, which we are right now, I mean, I think that 
that carries with it the need for sound extraterritorial regulation on the banks, what they're doing with the money that they're able to, to generate. Yeah, because I, I only bring this up because for the stablecoin issue, I think the, the biggest the, the biggest threat that we have from a, a policy perspective is if uh, one of these stablecoin issuers um, finds the regulatory environment inside the United States untenable and moves offshore and essentially becomes a private private euro dollar system where they're right, issuing right. dollars overseas yes. offshore uh, and the disclosure requirements are are not set by the United States uh, and and this becomes of a significant size um, so right, I, right. They, yeah. be, they become sort of money market funds on steroids uh, mm -hmm. doing a lot more things than money market funds can do right right so like when it when it comes to these stable coins I know you wrote your um, you wrote your paper, and you also helped uh, inform the presidential working group. Um, you know, you recommended three things. Uh, you recommended that the stablecoins be regulated as securities and brought under um, SEC purview. Uh, you also said that uh, the Department of Justice should enforce Section 21A of the Glass-Steagall Act. Right. Uh, and you also said that Congress should pass legislation mandating that all the issuers and depositors of stablecoins must be FDIC insured. Right. Um, so so the, looking at those in sequence, I mean, mm -hmm. um, there's a real question whether uh, stable coins are securities if they pay no interest um, and if they're issued by someone who, it, it's very decentralized. Um, now, I think that what we're seeing is that they're increasingly being issued by people who are distributed. And, and I, would, I, I would really apply similar requirements to both issuers and distributors, because to me, the distributors are like underwriters mm -hmm. uh, who distribute securities on behalf of the issuer. Um, it, it's still a very open question whether they would be considered securities, but it, it's maybe a, a, a closer question whether they are actually operating what are called investment companies, which is what money market funds are, that they're baskets of, of investments or securities, you know, issuing a security based on a basket. And that's what an investment company is. You're getting a share of the basket. Um, and so I think that, that there's some, the Investment Company Act is a very complicated statute, but there's probably some uh, reasonable argument that the, the SEC could make that these are investment companies and should be regulated essentially as money market funds. Um, so that may happen. And I think that's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Now then the, the DOJ, I think, the Department of Justice is the responsible agency for enforcing Section 21A, as you say, of the Glass-Steagall Act, which basically says no one can take deposits uh, except for banks, except mm -hmm. for chartered and regulated banks. Now, the question is, are stable coins deposits? Um, my view is that a stable coin that essentially represents or promises that you get back your money at par, which is 100% of what you put in, uh, within a reasonable time, uh, either on demand or within a reasonable period of time. Uh, so it's not a long-term debt uh, and, and leads people to believe that, you know, what you put in, you can take out, you know, again, under, under reasonable terms. Okay. Maybe some incidental fees, but you basically get back a hundred percent plus maybe minus some reasonable fee. That looks like that, that, that walks, flies, quacks, like a deposit and therefore it should be treated as a deposit that would stop people like, you know, circle, for example, from issuing stable coins, unless they obtain some kind of bank charter. Now, interestingly, the Glass-Steagall Act was passed just as the federal deposit insurance corporation was being created. So 21A does not say that the, the chartered bank has to be FDIC insured because the FDIC didn't exist yet. It was, it was created about a year later. Um, so that leaves open the idea that you could have a Wyoming, you know, essentially special depository, special purpose depository institution, which is really a crypto bank. You, you could, you know, Circle could get a Wyoming crypto bank and meet the requirements of 21A. Again, that would be better than nothing, but my view would be that's not a sufficient solution. So you're right. My ultimate recommendation is that Congress should say, if you're going to issue or distribute again these are stable coins that, that really function as deposits so to me terra would not be a deposit because 
okay, they may have said that you 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 should be able to get your money back, but anyone looking at it would say, wait a minute, they they, they have very small reserves. They're based on some kind of algorithmic trading between this coin and another coin, and who knows? And and I would bet that if you peel back on Terra, they they never actually promised or represented that you'll absolutely get a hundred percent back. They they wanted people to believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas USDC coin is is essentially saying, you know, we are representing and promising you you, you will get a hundred percent back. Now, yeah, there may be some fees, and it may take a little while, but you'll get your money back. That looks like a deposit to me. So for me, that kind of stable coin needs to be issued or distributed only by an FDIC insured bank. And to me, it would then the stable coins would become a, a tokenized bank deposit. Um, you know, essentially for all, all the reasons we've discussed. I just think that kind of, and of course, I would do the same with money market funds uh, that again provide deposit like treatment. I would do the same thing with PayPal's customer balances. I think if, if, if you're if you're providing deposit like services, it needs to be inside an FDIC insured bank, uh, for all the reasons we've discussed. So that's my ultimate. You know, that would be the 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 ideal world as I foresee it. Let's let's bring deposit services inside banks, and it's part of my whole larger program of separating banking from the rest of finance and from commerce. You know, let's. Let's have banks be banks and let's not have other things be banks. Yeah, I, I mean, hadn't didn't Circle apply for a bank charter? I, I, I thought I had read that somewhere that they had, uh, maybe this was the Wyoming Special Deposit Institution. Yeah, this is very about. interesting to me. So I, I, I checked their their registration statement. So in August 2021, they, they, they Circle filed a Form S4 registration statement looking forward to their IPO in which they said, we plan to apply for a national bank charter from the OCC with FDIC insurance and subject to supervision by the Fed under the Bank Holding Company Act. And my view is great. That's that's essentially the regulatory system that I would support. Now, then they the most recent amendment to their Form S for registration statement was filed on August 30, 2022, and they said, you know what, we may not be able to get a bank charter. Uh, we're trying, we're in consultations with the OCC and presumably the FDIC and the Fed, but we're not sure we're going to get the bank charter. And my question is, why not? You know, why are they not getting this bank charter that they say that they're, at, they're, they're trying to get? That raises caution flags for me. Why does the OCC or the Fed or the FDIC not think that Circle should get an FDIC insured national bank charter? with a bank holding company supervised by the Fed. I mean, that raises questions for me um, because I would say that for the reasons we've discussed, Circle looks like maybe the safest of all stable coins that are out there uh, that are of any size <coughs> that we know of. So why right. are the regulators yeah, not approving it for a bank charter? That raises some very interesting questions for me. Is it is it the case that Circle doesn't think that they'll be given the application or uh, the case that they're not going to actually apply for it in the first yeah, place? Yeah, they, what they say is they don't, they, uh, they're, they're, they're two filings, one in August 2021, one in August 2022. They, they don't actually say that we have filed an application. Now, mm-hmm. what generally happens with the OCC is you have extended discussions with the OCC of a preliminary nature before the OCC says, okay, uh, this looks good to us. Now you should go ahead and file your application and we'll do the formal review, but we basically pre-cleared it. Mm -hmm. They they, they generally don't encourage you to file an application that they don't intend to, to, to approve. People do that once in a while, but almost never, because it's, it's very embarrassing both to you and, and it's, you know, somewhat, it's somewhat controversial for the OCC to say, we denied this application, you know. Uh, so it's not clear that they've ever formally filed, but they do admit that they've been in consultation with the OCC and presumably at least to some degree with the Fed and the FDIC. And so what's not clear is why aren't they getting positive signals? Why aren't the regulators? I would think the regulators would be warmly inviting them to do this because, again, it brings them inside the regulatory, the fully regulated perimeter Mm-hmm. It, 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 it avoids any of the problems we've been discussing. 
I would think the regulators would love to get the best, the, you know, the, the, the best in class stable coin inside the fully insured, fully regulated bank perimeter and say, see, you can do this in, in a bank. It works. And so why isn't that happening? Uh, there's no explanation as to where the resistance is coming from. Are they having second thoughts because of all the regulatory requirements and costs? Do they think they'll get a better deal? One, one possibility is they think they're going to get a better deal from Congress because if they get either the Gillibrand Lummis bill or the House bill, which sounds a lot like Gillibrand Lummis, that's regulation light, right? And no FDIC insurance, no bank holding company supervision, uh, no Fed oversight. I mean, it may be Fed oversight, but not under the Bank Holding Company Act. So they may think they're going to get a better deal from Congress, possibly. Or is it that the OCC and the Fed and FDIC are not so comfortable with something about their, either their application, their business plan, their financial position, or their management? You can't, you can't answer those questions, but they, right. you can certainly raise yeah, I get, why is this not happening. Yeah, I guess from a political perspective, if they make it to midterms and you get a split right. house... Or split Congress. You may get a better deal from the next Congress, right? Yeah, you may. You might even just wait. You might even just wait until you know twenty twenty four when there's a new administration, or if there's a new administration, and you could just kick the can down the road. Maybe there's a a more friendly right, or right. regulatory environment for USDC at that point, and then then they can establish themselves uh, through their IPO. Yeah. I, I think it's regrettable that we we would this would have given us a test case mm -hmm. of seeing how one of these stablecoin providers operates within a fully regulated bank charter, fully insured F and, and Fed supervised bank holding company, I would have loved to see that test case and say, why, why isn't this a good approach? Why doesn't it work? I would actually enjoy that if, if we could have a greater clarity on USDC, because, you know, at like w what we're building at Frax, I mean, we're very dependent on USDC for, for inflows. And I think most of the crypto DeFi ecosystem is. And so, um, you know, having a, a much stronger position to say like USDC is firm. We know the regulatory environment around it. Uh, we know that they can grow and uh, probably a lot of institutions right. are on the sidelines, even looking at this saying like, okay, well, you know, $200 billion at the end of what well, actually, I think it's about 80 or $90 billion for, for USDC. That's a very small amount of money. It's not that it's not that much yeah, you know, the bigger I, scope I, of things. I wouldn't like, think that the OCC would um, reject it you know, based purely on the size, uh, they, they mm -hmm. would they would have to say there's something either about the business plan we don't like or about their financial position we don't like or about their management we don't like, uh, about the president we don't like. But then the question is, OK, what what's wrong? In other words, uh, if, if it's the OCC pushing back, what's wrong from the OCC's point of view or the feds or the FDIC's? Mm -hmm. If it's from Circle's point of view, why are they suddenly getting cold feet on something that they originally said they were going to do. I mean, they, they made it very clear, you know, uh, before they filed for their IPO, we're going to do this. So everybody should be happy. You know, we're, we're not going to go for, you know, as you know, under Brian Brooks, the OCC was offering a special purpose, non-insured depository charter, much like Wyoming's. And there was huge, there, there was a huge legal question about whether the OCC can issue a charter for an for a deposit taking but uninsured bank. I don't believe they can, uh, right. but there was a huge issue about it. And then Circle said, you know what? We're not gonna do that. We're gonna go for the fully FDIC insured, bank holding company owned, Fed supervised. We're, we're gonna avoid this whole legal question. I thought, great, <laughs> we're, we're gonna, you know, we're going in the right direction. And then suddenly nothing has happened for more than a year. Yeah, it would be, yeah, I I, mean, I I would like to see just a, a, I, I'm sure we'll get there, right? I mean, I don't think that the, at some yes, point this I, is I, going to be, yeah. It, I mean, we're going to get to some kind of too big or there'll be enough, you know, political right. uh, sentiment to push it in the right direction. Right. I, I guess I mean, like basically deposits are essentially <laughs> pretty much digital at this point anyway. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you don't have instantaneous payment, um, but in many ways, you know, you're, you know, our, our deposits are no longer physical. You know, like most people don't write checks except for very big items. They're using credit cards, debit cards. Uh, you know, so everything's kind of electronic already. So it it doesn't seem to me, you know, 
a, a paradigm shift to say, okay, let's go to electronic deposits. Stable coins, I think, to me, should be electronic deposits. Um, is there something magical about the the, the blockchain the technology that is better than what we have? Fine, but in other words, uh, it, does, it it seems to me that stable coins equaling tokenized electro, electronic bank deposits. I mean, it, it doesn't strike me as a radical concept. Uh, what, what strikes me as troubling is when you're trying to do this outside a bank and then it, it has all the shadow banking problems with it. Right, right. So at, at the end of the day, just to wrap up, um, would you disagree with your, your colleagues, Gordon and Zhang, about the this tokenized form of new money and stable coins? Do you think it can actually coexist with the government? with government money um, uh, or not, are there going to be long-term it, it issues for tokenized Yeah, if money? it doesn't exist inside a bank, then I think it creates an inherent tension and a problem. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, my view is let's, you know, let's tokenize the deposits and put them in banks. Um, uh, so I think there's a huge problem if it, if it exists outside a bank uh, for, for, you know, for all this, you know, that, 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 uh, you know, money market funds have already created this problem. Now we're seeing PayPal and other people creating essentially something akin to money market funds as payment devices, uh, customer balances. Uh, this would be a new form of, you know, uninsured customer money that could be used for payments. Uh, if in fact, it, it, you know, to me, from what I can figure out, it's going to take some kind of permission blockchain approach to make this stuff work as a general purpose payment. But I think, I think we're getting there in a sense. It's really interesting to me. You could tell me if I'm wrong, but Ethereum moving from a, you know, proof, proof of work to proof of stake, essentially they, they moved to a permission blockchain approach. If that works uh, and it starts being used for, you know, peer to peer or peer, you know, consumer to commercial payments or commercial firm to firm payments, you know, it, it's going to be some kind of permission blockchain. Uh, if that if that's good, then my feeling is um, we 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 better pay attention because again, if I think having completely separate payment systems with deposit links that are outside the banking system, you're essentially cannibalizing the banking system. You're undermining regulation, and eventually, if that payment system fails. You know, the Fed will have to, the Fed or the Treasury will have to step in and rescue it. Um, so what's re really interesting is if stable coins become a general purpose payment device, then it seems to me that they that would fit very naturally within a tokenized bank deposit, Fed now, instant payment, you know, work on on cross-border payments. If, if Fed now works, I don't see why we couldn't do something similar cross-border because then you'd have you know, foreign bank to U.S. bank. You know, it, 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 it strikes me as a as an evolutionary approach. What worries me is that if this evolution takes place outside the banking system, I think it's inherently unstable and and risk prone. Mm -hmm. Well, I I appreciate your views in in coming on today. I know that uh, probably many yeah, of my absolutely my industry pleasure probably. talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thank you again for coming on, uh, Professor Wilmarth. I I really enjoyed this, and um, we'll we'll have to have a future discussion once there's great greater care. Yeah, I look forward to our, our next discussion. That would be great. All right, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sam.